All right, we are now recording this session. And there may be a few others that join us momentarily. Um, again, my name is Jeff Stowell. I'm at Eastern Illinois University, and I am the assistant department chair and uh, faculty member. Uh, I've been here at Eastern for 22 years now. That's a great place. So uh, <clears throat> I'm glad that we're, we're able to join at least remotely for another my stop. I call it my stop. I know Ada calls it miss stop, but it's my stop. So <laughs> thanks for stopping in, um, <laughs> at least virtually. All right, so I'm going to uh, begin my presentation by sharing my screen. And let's get started. All right, uh, you should be able to see my slide presentation and you should be able to hear me. Um, if you have any problems with that, uh, please submit something in the chat. I should be able to see that. Uh, during this presentation, there'll be a few places where I will pause. Uh, we'll have maybe a brief discussion and, and those who are attending can um, ask some questions. Uh, at, at the same time, I, I will have hopefully plenty of time at the end for some questions and encourage you to participate. All right, so uh, the things that I'm gonna talk about today are first the, in three categories of, of information here. Uh, the initial impact of the pandemic on teaching, uh, including what changed and maybe what didn't change. Uh, second, portion will be about, and I put this in quotes, post pandemic, because I realize we're still in a pandemic, um, but hopefully we're getting past it and things will continue to improve from here out. And I will talk about things related to advising, some teaching methods for online as well as face-to-face. -face. And then finally, I'm gonna spend a fair amount of time specifically talking about online assessments and some of the fears that faculty and students have about online assessments, and then some practical applications and, and tips. So I'd like to begin just by sharing my own, I guess, pandemic experience. Uh, first, the at-home component. Um, I would say that our, our family was certainly impacted by the pandemic, but somewhat insulated because um, we don't have young children at home. Uh, we had two of our six children, the youngest two were still at home and they're in high school. Uh, you know, we of course did suffer uh, the problems of going fully online with our children and and uh, my wife was not employed outside of the home, so she could help support them uh, in their learning and, and the required technology. Um, so, and then I had to, you know, of course, work from home. And so my setup was in my wife's craft room, uh, which seemed to work fine um, during that experience. My online teaching experience, honestly, uh, really didn't change. I continued to teach online. And, uh, and at the same time, I still had two classes that I taught face-to-face -face, uh, every semester during the pandemic. Um, and then <clears throat> I guess my other experience is, is I started this semester uh, experiencing symptoms of COVID. So uh, even though I was vaccinated and boosted, I still got the Omicron variant. And so I'm pretty sure I'm immune now, but it wasn't fun. And I was, I guess, in some ways able to empathize uh, with students and others who are experiencing uh, similar challenges. So let's begin with the, the first grouping of content on initial impact on teaching and learning. And I'm certain that many of you shared similar experiences in at the conclusion of this list on this slide, if there's ones that I've missed that you wanna share or address, then you are welcome to unmute and share with the, the rest of us. 
So in uh, spring of 20, right, two, two years ago, uh, we were all impacted with the fact that we could not be present <laughs> in the classroom with our students. And at our institution, it happened to be during spring break. And of course we thought, oh, it'll just be a couple of weeks and then it'll be over. But um, realizing that it wasn't going to be, we then had an extra timeout week that allowed faculty to prepare teaching materials for online delivery. Now, many of us had taught online before, but I mean, you have faculty who suddenly you're like, okay, I now have to present my content and teach online when I've never done this before. And that was you know, dramatically stressful for a lot of people. Uh, it also initially magnified uh, existing issues related to accessibility, um, students that uh, had disabilities that you know, suddenly needed transcription on recorded lectures, uh, you had those who were uh, in rural areas with limited internet access. Uh, you had uh, issues of those who were medically vulnerable um, and you know, throughout the pandemic and still that, that just could not be in those in-person settings. Um, and so it really in some ways just magnified pre-existing uh, potential issues that, that we needed to uh, address and try to resolve. Um, certainly you've experienced disruptions in, in student and faculty attendance. Um, I cannot believe how many, it was really the worst, you know, at the beginning of this semester. It's getting notifications all the time from, you know, health services or, uh, or students themselves that like, you know, I've got to self isolate, I'm showing symptoms or I have to quarantine, I've been exposed to somebody who I sat next to. And, and it was just almost constant um, students saying, I, I can't come to class. And, and, and that's kind of a problem, right? When you're trying to teach uh, a face-to-face -face class, but we'll talk about adjustments and, and how we can solve some of these later. Um, one of the biggest challenges for me was suddenly I lost like two thirds of the nonverbal communication that I would get from my students in the classroom uh, because they're wearing a mask and all I can see are their eyeballs. And it, it makes it, number one, a lot harder to learn their names, which I always try to do. And so, you know, <laughs> I would record them, I would have them say their names. But with the mask on, it's, it's harder to uh, distinguish students from each other and, and it became more difficult. Uh, in addition, in our classroom, we had these, you know, these plastic uh, barriers that um, create a sound, somewhat a sound barrier as well. So I'm trying to talk through it. Students are trying to talk back to me through it, plus their mask. And, and for a while, I mean, I'm going to be 52 this year. And I was thinking, oh, no, am I, am I starting to lose my hearing? Because I'm asking students to repeat themselves a lot. And uh, fortunately, I don't think I, I am other than normal aging process, but uh, it was a real challenge. Uh, suddenly you had, you just lost something about, gee, I mean, are my students laughing at my jokes under those masks? I, I can't tell because their mouth is covered up. Uh, and then of course, when, when you have a lot of time spent in video conferencing, uh, you just get tired of it, right? And, and you're tired of telling people you're muted uh, or can you see my screen or can you hear me? And it's like, well, click the little microphone button and, and switch it and, and, you know, I mean, rejoin and, and, oh, we lost somebody for a minute. And you, you know, the challenges of, of having video conferencing, which, you know, we're probably experiencing during this conference, but uh, those are some of the initial impacts that we had. So let me pause for just a moment. And if you have um, other things that maybe you want to address that were just really a, a big challenge for you during the initial part of the pandemic or still, if you'd like to mention those. You can either put it in the chat or just go ahead and unmute yourself. Well, 
maybe I covered them. <laughs> okay. uh, of course, you know, this is another challenge, right? Um, Okay, thank you, Nick. Uh, honestly, it was that students have never taken an online class. Right, and so suddenly everybody was. And thank you, Rachel, for affirming uh, those list of challenges. Um, thank you, Valerie, managing work and life balance. Yeah, especially if you had you know, maybe children at home, suddenly you became an elementary school teacher at the same time. Uh, yes, the challenges of being able to do group work and classes uh, I had to make some changes in my in my teaching as well. Assignments that they couldn't do anymore as a group. Um, and and I'll just add that, um, yeah, yes, the caretaking responsibilities. Right, I had students who are like, you know, I've got to take care of family members, and and suddenly they they had some very grown up responsibilities um, that they were forced into. So, of course, this is one of the challenges of, of um, teaching in a video conference is your attention is divided between people joining, the chat, uh, your own presentation, um, trying to get feedback visually from the audience. It's, it's, a, it's demanding cognitively. Thank you. All right, um, things that didn't change, um, maybe it's a shorter list because so much did change, but you know, I found that my telephone still worked during the pandemic. And uh, that's great because I, even before the pandemic, uh, for our remote online students, I would do advising over the phone. And fortunately, that still worked. Um, Email still worked, uh, although students still don't read it very often, <laughs> some students. Uh, a lot of the assignments that I have for my face-to-face -face classes were still, uh, were already and continue to be submitted and accessed through a course management system. But one of the things um, that hopefully didn't change was your concern about students and their success. Now, last night, Lindsay talked about human-centeredness. I, I, I do like that term. But, you know, we, there's a lot of focus on student success. We, we, we want students to complete courses. We want them to graduate. Uh, we want them to get jobs. And as you know, institutions track these things, these very things as measures of student success. But if you were uh, concerned about student success before the pandemic, it was magnified during the pandemic. So here's a quote from uh, Michael Bastin, uh, the president of Rockland Community College, who thinks this is really the number one discovery about having experienced a pandemic in higher education. The genie is out of the bottle student expectations will ultimately play a more significant role and those expectations should inform how the learning elements we redesigned in response to COVID-19 became normalized in our colleges and universities. We must commit to listening more to our students and to better meeting them where they are. And I think that just really captures the um, Something that we've really learned is that, well, and something that I've learned is that, wow, students really face some difficult challenges in their lives. They, they work full time. Some of them have family responsibilities, um, difficult coursework. Um, it's, it's a real struggle. And then, and then you add the, all the elements of the pandemic on top of that. It really magnifies maybe the, the vulnerability of students and how much support they really do need. All right, so what are some of the things that have kind of emerged uh, from experiencing a pandemic? Uh, again, we're still in a pandemic, but quote unquote, post pandemic enduring outcomes. Uh, here's some great advice from somebody who is, is really wise um, about how things work. Good ideas for teaching after a pandemic were good ideas for teaching before the pandemic. Okay, <laughs> quoting myself there. Um, I just thought, you know, as, as, when you think about things that worked or things that are working, it's like, hmm, 
maybe I should have done that before the pandemic. And I mean, you know, I'm going to talk about some specific changes that I made that because of the pandemic, I made them. And I'm like, you know, I was so afraid to do something beforehand. And, and now it, I guess I don't have to be afraid of that anymore. And so uh, I'll share some of those things that, that are working. So here are some uh, specific things that um, I think are going to stick around after the pandemic. Um, you know, I, I can't see all of you right now, but I'm guessing that if you were to raise your hand, um, a lot of you probably now have done some form of lecture recording. And whether that was recording a live lecture uh, or doing a pre-recorded, uh, recorded, like narrated lecture using PowerPoint, which is pretty easy to do. Uh, chances are that most of us have probably done something like that. And uh, depending on how you did it, um, some, some technology means make it easier to go back and edit and, and update if you wish. Uh, others are pretty much fixed as, as they were recorded in time. But you know, depending on how you did that, uh, you probably have still have that content, which maybe you should continue to provide to students even when you're in a face-to-face -face setting. And uh, one of the um, things that students in a survey that was in a Forbes magazine article last year, uh, Brandon Busteed said, the number one thing that students would like to see continue after the pandemic is having recorded lectures available to them. And, you know, I found that that was really helpful, um, of course, during the pandemic, because if a student um, said, oh, well, I can't make it to class, then I could say, well, it's recorded online, you can watch it uh, and see what you missed. Now, that was a little bit easier, I think, for me, because all of the courses that I teach, I previously taught online and did have recorded lectures. So it was easy enough just to pull them over into my uh, current class and be able to do that. Um, Don, can I have you mute yourself, please? Step one was called distancing. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the problems of, of technology, right? So that's something that I would encourage uh, you to continue to use. And, and my fear was that, oh no, if I give students my recorded lectures, what's gonna happen? They're not gonna come to class, right? <laughs> well, guess what? Uh, they still come to class. And, and part of it is due to a participation policy, to be honest. But uh, again, even so, my, my greatest fears were not realized. Uh, they still come to class and, and listen to my jokes anyway. So, <clears throat> and I would encourage you to be yourself in your, if you're going to pre-record lectures, um, I've done it both ways where I, ha I felt like I had to have it just right and, and just very professional. And, and then I did it later and I was, you know, just myself, I was telling some jokes and the students just liked it so much better. So just be yourself uh, in whatever you provide. Um, I also realized that um, early on in, in the fall of 20, I taught a class on campus and I provided uh, my recorded lectures as well. And I found that probably only half of the student, and I, I, I didn't have a participation, well, still had a participation requirement, but they had an alternate activity if they're gonna be online. Because I gave them the complete option. I go, you can be in class, you can be online, uh, just tell me which one you're going to choose. And about half the class was online, about half in person. Um, and then the next semester when I taught, um, I basically gave the same options, but I had a lot more students coming to class because I think by that time they had realized that, oh, I, I actually like being in a classroom. I'm, I'm missing being around other students. And so uh, I did see a progressive change and in interest in students being in class. I think the pandemic taught them something about, of course, themselves. All right. <clears throat> um, other things that have changed since um, the beginning, I guess, the pandemic is the way I do advising uh, and, and or office hours. I have an online calendar, as probably many of you do. That's <laughs> 
one tech tip I would say saved me a ton of time once I get once I did that. Uh, and it's integrated with um, Teams. And so when a student signs up for an appointment, they can select to come in person or on the telephone or on Zoom or Teams. And uh, that appointment is, is automatically scheduled in Teams if they want to use that. Uh, if it's Zoom, I just send them a link. But it makes it really easy for students who, you know, again, they have busy schedules and, and maybe they can't get to campus at, at that particular time. Uh, it makes it just so much easier to, for scheduling uh, meetings with students. And, you know, some do come in, in person, but it's more flexible. And it, it gives students, you know, an opportunity to meet even if um, they're in quarantine or self-isolation, or sometimes a student's just sick, but they're feeling well enough that they can still talk over the phone or online, even though you probably don't want them in your office if they're showing signs, signs of uh, illness. Uh, another thing that I think is probably better and should be is the accessibility uh, particularly those who have disabilities. And <clears throat> when I think of, you know, last night, I know that there was someone uh, at the presentation who had requested live uh, transcription, uh, which is a great development in the software. And so now we have, at least in, in remote instances, um, live transcription, we have uh, automated closed captioning of, of, depending on the technology that you're using for your recorded lectures. Uh, I found that after recording them in PowerPoint, you can save it as a video file and then just upload it to YouTube and YouTube will automatically caption. Now, I know some will say, well, it's not very good, but you know what, you can edit those. Um, and it's really quite easy to do that if you take just a little bit of time uh, invested to learn how to edit your captions. And so I found that it was pretty good and it made it more accessible uh, to my students. This is something that I think I had, I had heard at another teaching conference. You know, it, it could have been this conference, it might've been another one, but uh, I just thought, oh, that's a great idea. And so I'm gonna try it. Well. Many of you probably, and myself, I would have a handout for an assignment and it would be very detailed and it would have, you know, be very refined because all the questions that students had asked previously. And so, you know, very detailed, lengthy examples and everything. But I don't think students always read it. <laughs> and so uh, I have an accompanying video that just describes the assignment. And, you know, it's almost like reading my document or the handout, but it gives students just another chance to, to listen to it and to answer maybe anticipated questions that students might have. And it just helps them feel more comfortable because uh, otherwise they'll come up and, and ask you and, and that's fine too. But um, I found that that's something that I, I think is helpful and I will continue to do in my classes. Um, this is something that, you know, again, I've, I've taught online for a long time, actually 20 years now, I think, taught online. And this is maybe something that, um, you know, either if you first started teaching online or maybe you have before, but, but I, I had a feeling that I needed to have maybe an increased presence, even in my online classes, um, during the pandemic, just to maybe be more in touch with my students, help them know that I'm available, that I'm, I'm present, I'm, I'm interested in, in meeting their needs. And, you know, I don't have any specific recommendations about how to do this other than, well, you know, interact with your students, uh, even if it's just a, a news post um, regularly. Uh, provide some comments on your student discussion board posts. Um, just help them feel like, you know, that you're there. And, and because I know that one of the challenges is some instructors, when they went online, it was like, okay, just read the book and take the test. And, and they were out of the equation. And I think that was hard for students. 
and they really appreciate knowing that their instructor is, is there. And this is the last one is increased flexibility of due dates. Um, you know, <laughs> I mean, grandparents died before the pandemic, right? Um, but it just maybe magnified the fact that there's so many circumstances in, in students' lives that we need to be mindful. Um, you know, whether or not you choose to be, to have, you know, severe consequences for late work or accept it at all. Uh, or if you're like, well, let's, let's talk about it first and see what, you know, maybe exceptional circumstances you, you had. Um, you know, I know a colleague of mine who, instead of having just pretty defined frequent due dates, kind of just gave a little bit longer time span for a group of assignments. Um, of course, we know that students will typically wait till the end uh, to do them. But anyway, just, just think about maybe building in some flexibility for due dates um, for your assignments. Um, for example, th this is not a due date, but in my participation requirement, um, I use some electronic polling in the classroom. And if students participate on 70% of the days that I record participation, they get full credit. That means that they can miss three out of 10 days, still get full participation points. Um, and during the pandemic, I lowered that considerably just to say, well, you know, you might only be here half the time and that's okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so just again, being flexible in, and, uh, in your assignments. Okay, so let's uh, focus a little bit specifically now on assessment during the pandemic. And, and to be honest, during, anytime when you're teaching online. So I know there are a number of fears that faculty have about uh, providing or conducting assessments online. And, you know, the first, of course, issue might be, well, do students even have access to the, the needed technology? Um, some instructors have a requirement of software that might prohibit or lessen the chances of cheating or using their computer for other things while they're taking a test. Um, some may require a webcam to do that. Um, it, it can be, it's a question that you need to consider uh, at any point, right? If you're gonna be doing online. Now, if a student's taking an online class, presumably uh, with, with expectations, they will have the technology. Um, probably the, one of the biggest fears is students are going to cheat. Uh, if it's online, they're going to use their book, they're going to use their notes, they're going to be in a group taking the test together, or at least uh, maybe screen capturing and sharing that information with other students. Uh, and that's a real concern, as we'll see in a minute a valid concern, I should say. Um, another problem for the faculty is just, it's a huge initial investment for putting exams online. And I mean, there's ways you can kind of stream that a little bit if you're using publisher databases with, with test questions, um, but still it's kind of clunky, bulky, and it, it can take a lot of time, especially if you have uh, your own original questions that you're trying to, to upload. So it, it takes a lot of effort. Uh, and, and unfortunately it takes a lot of effort even after it's already in a course management system to edit. And it's just, it's not super easy. Uh, and then finally, just worried that, you know, again, students are going to, screen capture or take pictures with their phones of your questions and, and share them. Now, <clears throat> I will warn you, <laughs> okay. uh, if you're using a publisher, um, test bank, I can almost guarantee uh, that whole thing is already online somewhere. And you'll find a lot of them on Quizlet, but there are other sites where they are study sites where you can you know, practice, but either instructors, knowingly or unknowingly have, have shared practice tests, which then maybe other instructors are using for their actual test, which uh, well, creates challenges for them to be able to do so. 
So I personally uh, did some searching uh, on Google of questions that I had asked on my online tests. And what do you know? They were online with the answers. And so that led me to invest a fair amount of time in rewriting those questions. And periodically, I will probably need to continue to do so uh, because you just cannot guarantee the security of, of either pre-manufactured test bank questions or even your own um, students can still do that. All right, are there, are there other fears maybe that you had of, of giving online assessments? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's whack-a-mole. It is. I understand. <laughs> it's, it's one of the challenges. <clears throat> but uh, I'll talk about something a little bit later that, that, might, that might at least lessen your fears if, if you take this other approach. Um, yeah, using other students, uh, that's, that's a concern. I mean, again, I've taught online for 20 years, and, and I have seen instances where students were responding so similar, similarly on open uh, ended questions that I knew they were collaborating with each other. So, um, <laughs> I think one of the, hello. Yes. Hi, Terry. I think, hi. I think one of the things I have found is after, uh, being online and now back in person, uh, is the closed book tests. Some of the students haven't had a closed book test in two years. And I noticed last fall, especially my freshmen had so much trouble with that. They, they got, they got better. But that was just such a shock for them and yeah. to get back into the closed book tests. Right, uh, because things have changed and, and some students have you know, not yet really fully experienced the college experience outside yeah. of the pandemic. Yeah. And uh, we're facing those kind of challenges. Thank you. All right, um, <laughs> here's just a little bit of information about cheating and and well, it does happen. So do they cheat? The answer is yes. And you know, over 20 years ago, this study was published. Um, McCabe has done a number of studies and on student cheating. And at then, that time was about 70%. And it has seemed to have been increasing. And when you ask about <clears throat> which parts of assessment they tend to cheat most frequently, it is on exams. And they, they ask, you know, why students cheat? Um, really, the number one answer is because their peers do. And if their peers are cheating, then maybe they have to feel like it's not a level playing field and they have to somehow compete with that. And um, <laughs> the study mentioned that 20% of children in first grade have cheated. And I'm thinking, how do first graders cheat? You know, I mean, if they if they copy the writing assignment, it's like awesome, you can write. You know, <laughs> or you know, did, did they turn in another student's crayon drawing? I I don't know, but uh, it, it seems to start early on and, and persist. And unfortunately, um, it carries over from education into the workplace. So uh, it is a significant problem. What about specifically? during the pandemic, here is a recent study. Um, when opportunity knocks, college students is cheating amid the COVID-19 pandemic. 75%, now first of all, the sample was uh, a little over 200 students from a research one institution in the Southeast. Um, these were psychology majors and most of them, well, average credits were in the range of a junior uh, at the time. So 75% of them report cheating and 46% for the first time during the pandemic. Now, that's not to say that the pandemic opened the door for cheating because if, they've, if they're a junior, um, they haven't had a chance to cheat in college because the entire period of time has been the pandemic. So what we don't have is a control group who over the same period of time started cheating. Uh, to know to that comparison. So that number may or may not be really relevant, but it's interesting. Uh, 
Uh, and when asked, you know, how they were doing it, um, some of them were using notes taped onto their computer monitor or group text messaging was a popular one, um, you know, searching a website or even the old fashioned way, you know, writing it on their hand. Um, what's interesting is that <clears throat> the differences in the, the assessments that students are cheating, again, prime, compared to in-person classes, the biggest differences are for those who are taking exams or quizzes, less of a difference in homework, although they're cheating a lot really in, in maybe both instances, um, the top would be 100% report down zero at the bottom. And for projects and papers, um, it doesn't matter if it's online or in person, they're, they're just much less likely to cheat on those. So, you know, one, one approach is to simply shift your assessments into more project based or writing papers, uh, because you probably know you can also uh, use plagiarism detection software to lessen cheating in written work. Um, 85% of the students in the study said that their instructors are using some kind of software to prevent cheating and that 16% of them tried to get around it. So uh, some, I mean, sometimes cheating is opportunistic, but sometimes it's really deliberate, okay? So uh, here's a couple recommendations that students reported uh, to reduce cheating. Uh, number one, just communicate clearly your expectations. So, you know, if you do have a project in which students could collaborate on each other or with each other, then just tell students that. Say, it's, I encourage you to work with a partner. Um, I have some of, a couple assignments like that in one of my classes. Um, you know, explain if it's okay or not to use their notes or their book or the internet while they're taking an exam or a quiz. Um, just, just be clear about those communications and then establish policies that allow students to know themselves when they've crossed the line and then encourage students to abide by those policies. Uh, and then finally, if you, Institutional honor codes that are talked about and part of the campus culture make a difference, they found in previous studies. Uh, but also if, in addition to that, having your own classroom honor code. So maybe spell that out on the syllabus, uh, what it means to you and what the consequences are for um, not abiding by the policies. Here's some uh, practical tips for reducing cheating, specifically, um, in online assessments. Now, I do online assessments in all of my face-to-face -face classes. I've done that for more than five years. I have given up on in-classroom testing, you know, on paper, pencil and paper. Um, and I'll talk about some reasons how I changed my assessments and why I don't do that anymore. But um, Here's some practical things that you can use regardless of whether or not you adopt some of the other methods I talk about uh, later. Uh, you can use plagiarism detection software. I use it as a way to help my students because I give them multiple opportunities to submit drafts and get reports of similarity of their texts with other sources so that they know that they need to cite it properly. And if they're quoting it, they need to include the page number. Uh, but it, I'm, I'm hope, and I give them some, of course, uh, range of permissible text that is in common with other sources, because obviously if they're writing about other research, some of it will be similar. But the intent is to help them develop in, in their writing rather than to be the plagiarism police. Um, again, you can has, have less emphasis on testing, maybe more on projects and papers. Uh, you can use timed quizzes so that they don't have an infinite amount of time to consult with peers or, or text message or use the internet. And so um, my general rule of thumb is about two minutes per question, multiple choice question. Uh, and and to be honest, I used to give one minute per question in the classroom when I gave exams in the classroom. 
But making them timed means that students have to have some measure of, of knowledge to be able to more quickly answer questions and do well on the, on the quiz. Um, you can also do a larger pool of questions from which randomly questions are selected for each student. Uh, and that means that each student will get a slightly different quiz, uh, presumably the same difficulty. And you can maybe move away from simple factual kind of multiple choice questions to maybe more conceptual uh, that, that require deeper levels of thinking and analysis. And maybe you could just say, you can use your notes and your book and the internet, but not your neighbor. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I, I had faced a few instances where students had cheated in their online tests. And I knew it because it had, they'd almost quoted the textbook. And so I thought, um, you know, what if, what if, um, I just let them, you know, of course the big fear is, oh no, if I let them use their book and their notes, everybody's gonna get a hundred percent. And I don't know why that's a problem, but you know, maybe, they're, maybe they won't learn anything or demonstrate they've learned anything, right? So I actually did a study and, a, and it was published a few years ago. Uh, I'm not gonna go into detail, but I had a class where mid semester I switched from closed book tests online to open book tests online. And on the very next quiz, I saw a little bump in the class average on the next quiz, but very quickly it went back down <laughs> uh, to where it was previously, as well as how it would compare to um, another class that um, it was closed book at the same time. So uh, what I found is that students don't get 100%. Um, I again tried to shift away from the more factual type of questions, although with biological psychology, neurons are pretty factual, but um, still students are not getting 100%, but um, it reduces their anxiety. And, and how can you cheat if I've told you, you can use your book and your notes and the internet. And, and so suddenly I guess I've just eliminated that possibility and I can say that, at least for me, it's, it's working. Um, all right, so here's a quote from, a recent quote from the Association of Business Executives. Uh, Gathering students together in large halls for memory recall tests is now looking more like an outdated concept and barely resembles the way that problems are solved in the information rich real world of work. When was the last time you took a closed book test? For me, it was more than 20 years ago when I moved to Illinois and took my driver's license written exam. Okay, that's the, that's the last one I can remember. Um, <clears throat> other than of course, you know, college and you know, standardized tests and so on. But I think that was the last one I took closed book. So by allowing open note and book and hopefully by asking the right kinds of questions, I'm, I'm asking students to find information and analyze and evaluate it in a novel, in a novel question. And so that's what I think we do as faculty is we, we have a question, we need to find information, we analyze it, uh, evaluate it, and it helps us answer our question. And that's what students will have to do when they are uh, employed. So here's my strategy for giving assessments for whether it's my online classes or on campus, it's the same, same exams. And I just published a paper uh, this beginning of this year in scholarship of teaching and learning in psychology. And it's called Repeated Cumulative Space and Incremental Secret Recipe for Improving Assess Assessments. So I've been doing this for more than five years and I give students two attempts on every quiz. I take the higher of the two attempts. So their first one, hopefully they use this kind of a self-assessment of what they don't know and then study that before they take the second attempt. 
But the first quiz is only worth seven points out of a 500 point course. So it's worth then it's it's worth um, just it's a lot less than two percent of their grade, and it's seven seven questions. Um, most of those are multiple choice. Well, maybe a two point multiple uh, a two point short answer. Every quiz has at least one short answer question worth a couple of points. But um, after they take the after I finish the first chapter, they take a seven point quiz on it within a few days after that. And then after I finish the second chapter, they take their second quiz, which has uh, questions from the second content from the second chapter. But I also carry over two questions from the previous chapter. So the quiz is a little bit longer. Okay. Uh, by the time I get to the third quiz, they have content from chapter three. They carry over two questions from chapter one, two questions from chapter two. And that continues through the entire semester. So that chapter one quiz questions um, are tested, are presented through every subsequent quiz. In other words, every quiz is cumulative. Um, it is incremental in the amount that's being tested at once. And it's open book and it's open note. So by the time they take the cumulative final exam, uh, it's really just five randomly selected questions from each chapter, 50 point final. But you might be thinking, wow, do students you know, balk at this? Does, does it freak them out? Well, here's some quotes from my students in the past. Uh, these are from, these are the comments from student evaluations at the end of the semester. So they're anonymous. I found, it, referring to me, his cumulative quiz format to be a bit daunting, but I also found it to be a great way to revisit previous chapters. Now that I've been exposed to Dr. Stoll's format, I do prefer it. I find that refreshing each week on what you learned during the previous weeks is a very important and effective way to learn and retain information. I love, who would have thought, right? I love the cumulative quizzes, even though they can be hard and it makes the material throughout the semester easier to remember. Although cumulative tests at the beginning seems annoying, I do feel that they're admitting, I do feel they have helped me remember the material better. The test formatting used was excruciatingly helpful. Wow, that's what a compliment. <laughs> I was nervous that I would just cram the information to pass the class and forget everything, but I've learned so much. So, Wow, I mean, students are learning. And that's, that's what I want students to take away from my class is that they feel like they have mastered the material. Will they remember it in the years to come? Probably not, we know how memory works, but at least at some point in their life, they can say, I knew that. And, and I felt like I knew that. And I remember how I felt. So that uh, concludes the, presentation. We've covered those three major areas. Um, but now there's a, about four minutes left for questions. So um, I'm going to stop sharing so I can see each other, each of you a little easier. And you can either turn on your video and raise your hand or virtually raise your hand. And then I will, I will call on you. Or you can use the chat as well. Uh, Nick had asked me, were you using Honor Lock? Um, no, I'm not familiar with what that is, though. Nick, would you like to share? Hi, Jeff. Hi, everybody. Happy Friday. Uh, great presentation. Hi. Um, I, I don't use Honor Lock, but uh, some of the some of the uh, some of the faculty at Moraine Valley do, uh, like in the uh, bio department. In the basically. Um, so it locks your screen. So when you open up a quiz or like a major assessment like that, it locks your quiz. You're not able to open up any tabs. Uh, um, I've heard that you have to like, kind of like do a scan of your whole room. Uh, and there's like this algorithm. If you look down, if you kind of look elsewhere, if you're talking like, like it, it sends all kinds of reports to your teacher 
And yeah. so there's all kinds of like weird pa- false positives. And uh, I just know how I would feel, you know, um, <laughs> I would feel paranoid and on alert the entire time and <laughs> it creepy. Yeah. <laughs> And so I don't use it. And that's the only reason that I was asking Jeff if you use Honor Lock, because um, as far as I know, I mean, if you know, so my students have probably always been using their book in my online class. And I do a lot of the things that you suggested, you know, 20, you know, 30 minutes for 12 questions. Uh, I use a random, uh, random selection of uh, questions, you know, I have 80 questions that you could potentially get and the program picks 20 of them for you. And so I've done all those things. Um, and uh, so I, I've always figured though, the reason that I asked um, if you use Honor Lock is because then you, you can monitor. So if you always use Honor Lock and you, know, you could see if they're using their book or not. And if you say you could use your book, then you could, then you could see that on, on, on Honor Lock. I was just curious. Yeah, but they've always been using their book. They always use their book as, since since 15 years ago. I know they do. Yeah, and and I just worry about. I mean, there's there's have been issues related to you know maybe uh, privacy, of course, um, maybe um, again the false positives, and then who's going to have to monitor all that and and then raise it with a student and say, I saw you look away. Were you cheating? It's like, well, no. Somebody rang my doorbell. I, there's just so many things and I'm, I'm, I don't go there. And so I, but I know, I know it's there, but you know, it's, there's just so many ways around it anyway. Okay, uh, thank cool. you, Nick. Hillary. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I think students are smarter than I am. So anything I devise to keep them honest, they're going to find ways around it. So the approach that I've taken is to let them think that they're sort of cheating. Um, and I included one in the chat that, uh, particularly for final exams, I let them bring in one sheet of paper with whatever they wanted to write on it, um, which they thought was like cheating. But my purpose was to get them to process on a deeper level so that they could sort, well, what's really important to know and what isn't important to know. And then a lot of them would tell me I didn't even need to use the piece of paper. Um, But the other thing that I do to let them sort of think they're putting one over on me is um, I'm a big fan of partner tests um, because they will argue why their answer is correct over the one that the partner thinks is correct. And they actually listen to each other because both their grades are on the line for it. Um, So that's the one situation where learning actually takes place during the testing period. Now, I've I've never done that for like a final exam, a really high stakes exam, but I I think I'd feel comfortable doing that because they do that again, it's processing at a deeper level because they need to be able to justify why they had the right answer. Thank you. Well, I know our time is up. I appreciate your joining the session and uh, hope to see some of you in the future, maybe in person next year. Have a great afternoon.